Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, most of you online here will know me, but just introduce myself. My name is Ailey McGrath and I'm the Senior Enterprise Development Officer here with Local Enterprise Office Kilkenny. And I'm joined this morning online by my colleagues, Catherine Hennessy and Emma Cal. And I suppose on behalf of the Local Enterprise Office and Enterprise Ireland this morning, I just want to welcome you here. Um, and uh, first off is to thank you very much for accepting the invitation to attend. We really do appreciate it. And I suppose I invited you here to attend. What I had in mind was the Agile Innovation Sport may be suitable for your business this year. And I, I kind of wanted to bring it to your attention so that as you work through your R&D plans, your innovation, your investment plans for this year and future years, that you can keep it in mind as a possible support avenue for your business. So I do hope that you find the coming hour kind of well invested and, and time well spent. Just in terms of housekeeping this afternoon, just a reminder, we are recording uh, and we'll make the presentations and recording available for you afterwards, uh, if you wish. So just, just to bear that in mind. Just in terms of our plan for the coming hour, our first speaker is Park Doolan from Enterprise Ireland. He'll speak for around kind of 15 minutes and outline the details of uh, the Agile Innovation Fund. And then we'll move to Aidan O'Connor from the Pembroke Alliance, who will kind of provide case studies and examples of successful applications that they have worked on in, in, the, in that company. Uh, then we'll move to questions and answers. And I suppose now is an opportune time just to bring your attention to the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. So as we go along, pop in your questions there on the Q&A and I, I will come to them at the end when both speakers are finished and we'll run through the Q&A and I'll bring in the panel members who can, who can answer the questions as appropriate. Uh, so I suppose I'll just welcome our panel members just before we get started. So representing in-company R&D supports within Enterprise Ireland, we're joined by Park Duden, who will be speaking in a minute, Debbie Nolan and the unit manager, Joe Madden. And from Pembroke Alliance, we have Aidan O'Connor and John Daly, who are both specialised advisors in the Agile Innovation Fund. So when we go to, into q and I'll, I'll be bringing those panel members in as appropriate to kind of answer the questions. So I suppose let's get started. Um, our first presentation will deal with the Agile Innovation Fund itself. So I'm going to invite Park Doolan, who's technical advisor with the R&D and I Fund uh, in company R&D supports unit within Enterprise Ireland. So I'm going to invite Park now to unmute himself, share his screen and uh, kind of take it from there. Thanks, Park. Thanks, Aileen. And uh, everyone's going to be delighted that the, the unit is now uh, less of a mouthful. It's now company R&D. Okay. So, uh, it should make presentations like this a lot easier. So uh, I hope everyone can see my screen there. Aileen, you can let me know if there's any, any challenges. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Aileen mentioned, um, my name is Padre Doolan, and I'm the technical advisor to the Research Development and Innovation Fund here at Enterprise Ireland. And we're delighted to be invited by Leo Kilkenny to speak uh, today. And I'd like to talk about the Agile Innovation Fund and how it can help your company on your R&D journey. So the Agile Innovation Fund, its focus is really on the development of new or substantially improved products, services, or processes where the total project cost is less than 300,000 euros. So that's the, the high level guide for the fund. So I know many of you may be struggling with the effects of Brexit and, or, and also, you know, we're just emerging from lockdown. I'm sure COVID has had been hit all of your businesses very hard. And we want you to know that we are very empathetic to that. Uh, and, and we understand the challenges that you're facing. And, and perhaps you're thinking that maybe R&D is just a step too far for you right now. And while we can understand that, we, it's really an opportunity you're letting go by, by taking that approach. And so to buttress this point, we looked back over almost 500 companies that had availed of our company R&D supports over the past 10 years. And they're represented by the green bars in this plot. And we compared them to a group of similarly, similarly segmented uh, companies, 741 in total, over that same period that didn't avail of our R&D supports. And really the difference was very striking. Um, even if you just focus on domestic sales, companies that performed R&D had more than 60% higher domestic sales than companies that didn't perform it. But the real distinction was actually on export sales. And in many ways, that's not surprising because an export focus is actually a prerequisite for getting this funding. But still, companies that performed R&D had almost six times the amount of export sales as companies that didn't. 
Uh, so you combine those two together, companies that availed of our R&D supports had more than triple the turnover of companies that didn't, and they had more than twice as many staff and full-time employment. So it's a real opportunity that, that is available to you. So uh, proposals that come into the fund, they largely fall into two different types. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and, and hopefully you can, it'll help you decide whether your idea uh, fits, which bucket it fits into. So if your idea is a new product or a service, then it could be suitable for Agile. But maybe your idea is a new process, then it could be suitable for our business innovation scheme. Now, business innovation projects attract a grant rate of 50%, no matter the size of your organization. So if you cast your mind back to my first slide, the maximum project costs were 300,000 euro. That's 150,000 euro we can give you back upon successful completion of your project. If your project's an R&D project, um, you know, the, the grant rates are a little bit smaller, but for small organizations, as many of you will be, considering this is a Leo Kilkenny event, the grant rebate there is 45%, so it's almost as good. It's 35% for a medium and 25% for a large enterprise. The eligible costs then are salaries for staff members to complete the project. We levy 30% overhead on those salary costs. You, all, you can also include any materials costs for prototyping or validation. If you identify any skills gaps that you, you can fund those through consultancy, and you might also incur some travel and subsistence costs. And then finally, because you may be developing a new product, et cetera, there may be certification and clinical trials costs. They're all allowable as well. So hopefully you're at this event because you, you've got an idea and you're wondering whether it's, it's an R&D or is it business innovation. So I'll, I'll give a little bit more detail to help you decide. So an R&D project will typically involve the development of a new product or service, and it'll usually involve the acquisition of new knowledge and skills. And it'll frequently, although not always, involve prototyping, significant testing and validation of those new improved uh, products or services. Very importantly for us, it cannot just include routine changes made to existing products and processes. That's not gonna cut it as R&D. And then finally, most crucially for us, the project has to demonstrate some measure of technical uncertainty and risk. So we're very familiar with R&D here at Enterprise Ireland. We know that risk is an inherent part of any R&D proposal. And this is certainly one scheme where you can be upfront and explicit about that risk. If there's no risk involved in the proposal, then it probably isn't R&D. So that's a really important uh, point to keep in mind. By contrast then, Business innovation proposals, they cover either process innovation or organizational innovation or very often a combination of both. So a process innovation is a new or significantly improved production or delivery method. So a good example of that would be, say, you've got a, a, a production conveyor belt system in your factory. It's got a defined number of steps in a particular order, and you know that you can run it at a particular pace. You have a defined number of staff to, to generate a batch. You can generate X amounts of batches in a day. They're of a particular quality. You know that process inside out. And you're so familiar with it, you've come up with a new creative way of maybe realigning some of the steps. Maybe you can drop some of the steps or increase output or increase product quality or even workplace safety. And you know, though, to implement that new uh, conveyor belt system, you're going to have to do some batch runs. You're going to have to consume some materials. You're going to have to sec on some of your staff to do those batch runs. And at the very end, particularly if you're in a regulated industry, you're going to have to incur some certification costs to show that the product of the new process is every bit as good as the one in the old. That's, that's a lovely process innovation proposal right there. Uh, an organizational innovation, then that's where you're implementing a new organizational method in your business practices or your workplace organization or even your external relations. So a good example that we see, we see a lot of actually, is in digitization. So let's say, for example, you have a paper-based method, uh, say for staff resourcing, and it's highly inefficient, maybe it's labor intensive and it's error prone, and those errors are impacting on staffing and that's impacting the output of, of your company. And you wanna to move to a digital solution. And you don't even need to develop that digital solution. You can identify an off the shelf product, 
once it needs substantial reconfiguration, tailoring and customization and training in order to make it uh, fit into your business. That's a lovely organizational innovation proposal right there. So hopefully at this point, you've got an idea, you know it's up, whether it's r and or business innovation, and you're wondering just how supportive we are. Well, the answer is we're, we're really supportive. We support R&D activity, uh, for EI clients, Leo clients, Uderos clients, all across the country, no matter the size. Um, I look back at our uh, business review data for 2020, we received 135 applications and 116 of those were approved. So that's a success rate of over 86%. Of those uh, uh, awards that were over 50,000 euro, 20 of those were Leo clients. There was 76 EI clients and five Uderos clients. And we had a further 97 applications of various descriptions approved from the fund. If you look at the graphic on the right, now this is not all R&D funding. There's also some industry capability and food supports in there as well. But you can see that there's, the funding is dispersed all across the country. Dublin does take about a, a third of the funding, but the, the south and southeast took almost a quarter. And then in, in the other Midlands, Midwest, Northeast, West and West regions, they each took about 10% of, of that funding. So really these supports are dispersed all across the country to companies just like you. Uh, I recently pulled out our data for last year and we got uh, 94 uh, applications into the fund. They're represented by the blue bar. 86 of those were approved. So that's an approval rate of over 90%. Uh, and all the other ones uh, that are represented by the yellow bar, they're actually ongoing. It's very rare for a proposal to get uh, rejected outright. We're working with all of those applicants to get uh, them all the way through the process. And the reality is that if you're eligible and you have a good idea and you put together a good proposal, the, sign, the odds are you will get this funding. And the final piece then I'd like to say about our motivation as an organization is we, we recently launched our new strategy just in the last few weeks. And there is a huge organizational focus on research and development. And one of our KPIs is that we, we seek to have 1.4 billion euro in R&D expenditure in the next two years. And we anticipate the knock on positive effects on exports, productivity and sustainability that we, you see there. Right, so hopefully, at this point, you have your idea. You know whether it's R&D, you know whether or it's business innovation, you know we are fully behind supporting you in, 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 on this R&D journey. You're thinking, what do I do next? Well, the next step we would always say is talk to your, your development advisor. If you're a client of EI, Leo Kilkenny or Uderos, talk to your DA and pitch your idea to them. The next step then is the outline proposal process. And you can apply for this even if you're not a client of any of these agencies. So the outline proposal is a one page document. It's available from the, the EI website and I've included a link at, on the last slide uh, of this talk. You, set, you fill out that document, it'll take you 30 minutes and email it to us for feedback. The email address is there, it's also included on the document. And we commit to giving you feedback within three days. In reality, we give you feedback the next day or in worst case, two days. So two days later, you'll know whether your idea has merit as an R&D proposal or not. Um, the next step then, if we're all agreed, you should go forward. The full application process is just two steps. And one of them is the online application wizard. And that's effectively gonna talk you through the whole application process. It, we're really looking there for an overview of the company. So it's all details that is sitting in your business plan anyway. You'll also include an overview of the project and a detailed breakdown of the project costs. And then the second piece of the application is the six section uh, Word document or pro project plan. And that is focus on the technical side, the scientific side, and that'll include sufficient information to let a tech assessor validate if your project is eligible under state aid regulations, are your costs reasonable? And if there's a clear R&D element, that risk piece I spoke about earlier. So this is my second last slide. And I just, before I go, I'd like to just destroy three R&D myths. The first myth is that R&D is only for big multinationals. Well, the reality here is that many small businesses have successfully done R&D and regularly do so. And we've recently concluded a survey of Leos and the feedback from the Leos is that roughly 10 to 20% of SMEs are suitable for R&D funding. So that's quite a large body of companies that are suitable. The second myth, 
is that, okay, you might be thinking, I have an idea, but I have no scientists on the team to do the work. Well, the reality is that many small businesses do R&D all the time, and they just don't think of it in those terms. But if you do identify a real gap that's there, you can fund it for the project through consultancy, or if it's, if it's a role that would grow into a, a role for the company post a project, you can actually fund it through a new hire. And the final myth I'd like to destroy is that it'll, it'll take you too much effort to submit an application. Well, the reality is if you decide to go down this road, Leo Kilkenny or your EI representative or Uderos development advisor will appoint a business advisor and maybe a mentor as well to walk you through that process. But even if you're not a client of any of these agencies, the application wizard is quite intuitive. It'll walk you through the process and we have downloadable examples available from the website as well. So you can see exactly what is involved. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. All our contact details there, uh, email and phone number. Uh, I've included a link to the Agile page on the website and also a link to the, the sat downloadable examples that you can uh, have a look at. And you can also link into our case studies. And if I can leave you with one message is that if you have what you think is a, an R&D idea, don't sit on it any longer. Talk to Aileen and the Leo Kilkenny guys pick up the phone to us or drop us an email and let us get you started on your R&D journey. Thank you for your time today. Thanks very much, Parag. That was, that was great. And I suppose just to kind of reinforce what Padraig said there around um, get, get started. So the project plan is there. We'll circulate these slides, the project plan template, talk to myself, talk to, to Bar and the R&D team, Joe and Debbie are here as well today. And I suppose just to, to reinforce, we will help you along this process. So I will help you. We have mentors who can help you as well. So I suppose as we're going through today's presentation, if there's an idea coming to mind, if there's something that you have kind of in your head or that you are working on, you know, I'll send that project plan later. And, you know, maybe it's something just to get started on it, uh, just to reinforce that message. Uh, I suppose moving on, just a reminder right now at the stage that we're at, um, the Q&A box is there. Please pop your questions into it as you think of them. We'll go through them later on um, as a panel. So pop in your questions. There, there's no question too big or too small. So, so just pop it in there and we'll take it from there. So, so the, the next speaker I want to introduce is Aidan O'Connor. And Aidan is a mechanical engineer by background, but has worked for 30 years on as a technical advisor and worked with the Enterprise Ireland Evaluation Committee for these types of projects. And Aidan is just going to bring us bring us into the next level in terms of what the process is around Agile and examples and case studies of projects that that, that he has worked on. So Aidan, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Aileen. First of all, I have to say I'm very pleased to be asked to participate in this uh, Agile grand presentation this morning, uh, moving into the afternoon. And uh, while I may be repeating some of the uh, items that uh, Patrick has mentioned, it's just by way of uh, reinforcement again. So um, I'll be glad to answer any of your questions too at the end of it. But just to uh, kick off now, if uh, Andy could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, just to give you an overview of what I hope to uh, accomplish this afternoon, brief introduction about myself, uh, more information on the Agile Innovation Fund, Details of the financial support is there via the grant scheme, a look at what the grant application entails, and an in-depth look at a sample grant application and broken into so many number of steps, and various sample grants that we have assisted clients with. And then very importantly, of course, is when you have completed your project and you want to claim for the expenditure you've incurred, there is a process for claiming the grant. And that's quite onerous in a way too. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. And then what we have there, wins following completion of an Agile project is really to show you what has been accomplished with the Pembroke Alliance Agency over the past few years. And then we come to Boost Grant. This is a, a inter-trade uh, document that's uh, cross-border in effect and uh, my colleague John Daly will be uh, emphasizing that and enlarging upon that. So if you could move on and just explain who I am and what I am, there you can see me there. I'm a mechanical engineer as uh, Aileen has said, background, but 
Uh, most of my life, my working life, I've worked outside of Dublin. In fact, I've worked uh, in the four provinces of Ireland at one time or another. Um, and I engaged in either engineering management and then worked my way up the ladder till I was managing uh, director or CEO of uh, tech, high tech companies. And um, most of it would have been with health, American healthcare companies or German or uh, British companies involved with high tech products as well. So um, I was on the R&D committee for over 30 years. So I've seen an awful lot of uh, evaluations and been involved in a lot of decisions with major companies and small companies and so on. So, you know, I've become very familiar with the whole idea of R&D and presentations and applications for grants. And uh, I only just retired from the Enterprise Ireland Committee just in June or July last year. I was taken on with Pembroke Alliance. And since then, well, actually since February last year, I've been carrying out agile grant applications for the Pembroke Alliance company. So if we move on a bit, uh, we'll just get into this. Now, what does the grant application entail? Well, essentially it's two documents. There's a grant application which is carried out online and there's a project plan, which is a, a Word document. Now, the grant application that's online consists of 14 sections and just quickly go through them. It, it basically looks back at where the company has come from and the type of business it's in. And then uh, in the course of generating a, an R&D project, where is the company going to and what does it expect to achieve? So there are the sections, company profile, the company contact, this is the lead person that uh, is the pivot around which the whole project is run, and they're the contact person that uh, deals with it. The business background of the company, where you come from, your products, your markets, and so on. Then a project overview, just simply stating what you plan to do. And then there's the project plan, which is basic in this case, it just kind of gives a short summary of what you hope to achieve. And then it comes to the costings and that breaks down into salaries. And when you figured out your salaries, which usually tends to be something in the region of 35 to 40% of the total project cost. But then um, you get overheads as well, which is 30% of the salaries. And that's the cover insurance and lighting and all of the rest. Then if you have to travel in the course of developing the uh, application, which might involve visiting suppliers, it might involve visiting prospect prospective customers where you're, you're going on a data uh, logging experience to find out what they might suggest would be best for the product uh, to, that you're developing, uh, what they would want from that. Then if you need expert help, you can take in consultancies uh, you know, many a time you might really need this, especially for some feature of business you haven't been in before. And then you might have to develop prototypes and use up materials to produce the prototype. And uh, certification and clinical trials are covered as well, but not in the everyday run of things. They must apply to the uh, objective of developing an R&D project. Then there's the final was the grant request simply um, accumulates all of the information and it puts it together. There's questions about your finance, if you have any loans, how are you going to generate the finance to uh, fund the project. There's also a question about gender balance. It's very important in modern society that you know the, gen the gender mix is kind of standard. And then there's the standard declaration where the managing director or two directors of the company have to has to uh, confirm that it, everything written in the uh, documentation is a true and accurate account of uh, what the position is. And this can be anywhere between 10 and 20 pages. So if you move on to the next one. Now, what does the project plan contain, entail? It, this is more a technical uh, document and it would be completed by the technical lead within the company usually. And uh, it includes five sections, the project objective, what is the solution to the proposed uh, work you're going to do? What innovations will it have? What would be different about it? Uh, what, your, what will be 
a kind of idea that you've come up with that you think will greatly improve your performance, both commercially and technically. And then, of course, this is the risk element that Podrick mentioned. There are always going to be technical uncertainties because R&D basically is a voyage of uh, discovery. You may not know what you're actually going to meet until you meet it. So that's part of the uncertainties that you have to express. Well, I'm not too sure about how, how I'm going to tackle this. And then finally, there's the project act activities and the plan. It's really a, a, a milestone description of how you're going to carry on uh, through to the, the completion of the um, project. And this can be anything from six to 12 pages. So if you move on again, Andy, please. Now, this is a very, I just want to give you an example of one of the, the many that uh, Pembroke Alliance have uh, carried out. And one of these was with a gas equipment manufacturer. And I have to say, like I've been, I've got a lot of mileage on the, on the clock as regards different technologies and so on, but I'd never seen anything like this because I think the common experience of anyone in industry, if you need gas, you go to say uh, BOC, the uh, British Oxygen Company, and you get in your methane or you get in your carbon dioxide and they all come in big bottles and pressurized, or in some cases, you may have liquid uh, nitrogen or liquid uh, oxygen supplied to you in a tank form. But this company actually make uh, nitrogen. The, the, the basic uh, industry uh, material that they supply is nitrogen gas. And it was very interesting that the cost of their um, raw material is free because it's the ambient air that's around you. So um, nor normal and ambient air consists of 78% uh, nitrogen and approximately 21% oxygen. And then there's the last 1%, about 0.8% of that is uh, argon. So in, they have a system, a, a machine, that when you take in the ambient air, it separates nitrogen out through a filtration process. And it's 19, up to 99.95% um, pure. And you can even get up to 99.99% 99 pure uh, nitrogen if you wish as well. So just to tell you, who are the people who would be using nitrogen and using this equipment to generate their own nitrogen? They'd be in the food packaging for extending shelf life and preserving the, the image of the, the food that's in the package. The brewing industry uses a lot of nitrogen. It's used in laser cutting, uh, in metals processing, also in heat treatment of metals. It's used in the pharma industry. A very interesting use is in the aviation industry because uh, the tires that are on aircraft uh, are not pumped up with air, they're pumped up with nitrogen for a, a very critical safety reason. Um, then chemical handling, fire prevention, nitrogen is also used in archive protection where you have a, a library with expensive books and so on. It's usually nitrogen that's there for that. Now this company have, a, 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 they are a, a Leo company. There's only eight people in it, but they've multi-million turnover. The type of customers they have are Brady's Ham, Kerry's Food, Tato Crisps, Aer Lingus, as I was mentioning with the uh, airline tires, McHale Engineering, who do a huge amount of export work in metal fabrication and agricultural equipment. And the state laboratories use um, nitrogen quite a bit for forensic um, analysis and so on. Uh, Diageo, of course, is in there as a, a customer as well. So if we move on, we'll just go through a little bit about it. Um, the, this is where Enterprise Ireland wants you to detail the market opportunities that you know exist uh, on foot of the current business that you have. So obviously looking for a financial assistance is, is, is due to some new product that fills a gap in the market that you think exists. Now, what happens with the nitrogen company, and most of it goes it, most, most of the nitrogen generation is for the packaging industry. And it often happens that packaging uh, equipment suppliers in discussing with a company they're putting equipment in will say, by the way, um, this company is looking for 
a model of a, a, a machine that would be much smaller than the usual ones. So if you move on, Andy, I'll just uh, explain a little bit about the, the um, design of the, the and description of the, um, the project. This one was to design, manufacture, and market a reduced si size nitrogen gas generation system with the capabilities of auctioning carbon, carbon dioxide mixing capabilities, specifically aimed at several sectors of the food industry. Now, the problem with this company was, it, it really was only for the big players. And the cheapest unit you could get was something like 30, 30 grand. But some of the units that I've seen in this company would be up to 2 million. But there's a huge opportunity within the smaller companies like Leo companies who are in the food business like butcher shops, uh, supermarkets, the craft beer industry and craft foods industry as well, who wouldn't have the you know, commercial capability and the resources to purchase machines of the value that I've just spoken about. So this company was facing um, the possibility of manufacturing units that could sell for about 10,000 uh, euro. And there is no question about it, when the owner of the company went around and gathering information, he found there was a tremendous amount of interest in, in that prospect. And so instead of having a big machine out in your factory floor that covered about 10 square meters, this would be like a countertop or something like your a, a, a domestic fridge, that scale of operation. Now, most companies, of course, if they want to expand and increase their revenues, they're, they're usually thinking of building bigger machines and more expensive machines. But in this case, this company is going the other way. And by so doing, they expect that there's tremendous market potential with this type of product because uh, exporting something that weighs about 14 tons or 12 tons or something, uh, your export potential is, is fairly limited because of the excessive freight costs. So we just move on to the next one, Andy, please. Now, as I outlined before, there are the, the costs that are covered in the project, salaries, overheads, travel, consultancy, and material and prototype costs. Now, the gross salary of the members, it is restricted to 80,000. If you happen to have someone in your team that you want on the project, if he earns more than 80K a year, it's only 80K that's, that's granted. And then the overheads at fixed are a maximum of 30% of the total salary costs. Now, the travel and subsistence, uh, they're generous enough, but the, you, you, you can't expect that Enterprise Ireland or the Leo will subsidize you going to five-star uh, hotels or uh, traveling first class on aircraft or even in train. So there's a, a fixed rate, but it's generous enough. And, uh, you know, you're covered for anything to do with any travel and subsistence to do with uh, bringing the uh, project further along the line. Um, and the grant rate, of course, is 45% of what your total would, would, would be. This is for a small industry. So moving along to the next step. Uh, now, in the final section of the application de details the company's employment levels, turnover, profitability, all of these have to be provided. And then the sales pipeline is then required and how the company will fund the balance of the new product. Finally, we provide detail of other funding previously received from EI or the LEO for, before the application can be signed off. Obviously, if you have a track, track record with the LEO or Enterprise Ireland, uh, it, it, it's brownie points if you have been successful with it. So they just do like to know about that. So moving on again, Andy, thank you. Um, Okay, I, I really explained this thing. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I want to get, to be honest with you, to get to uh, ones that we have completed. And this one is in train at the moment. It's going very, very successfully. And they're uh, about to produce a prototype any month now. They expect to have it sometime in the next couple of months. And that will be, be tested and hopefully it'll, it'll go well for, for, for the company. So Andy, would you move on, on a few slides there? I don't want to go into too much detail. I've mentioned it before. 
Okay, that's about it. So, yeah, it's just repeating again what uh, Podrick was saying. So carry on past uh, step 11, yeah. Now, <clears throat> over the past two years, these are the type of um, sectors that we've been involved in and the, the, the status of the grant and what it was to do with. Now, fruit and vegetable preparation, a lot of big companies involved in this and they got a grant of 154K. Now, one of the objects of the uh, project was to utilize the waste stream because it's very common in preparing foods for the food service industry or for display in uh, supermarkets and so on. They have to look good, they have to be clean and cooked properly and so on. So there's usually about 30% waste. And this is universal. This happens in the United States and Britain, continental Europe, everywhere, because it's not due to any inefficiency of the operation. It's just there are off cuts that have to be produced to present the, the, the product in an attractive way. And this, this project was, was quite successful. The company, have, uh, they're making pestos, they're producing uh, soup uh, ingredients from the waste stream. And they've also de developed a whole new range of uh, products as well. Metal fabrication uh, company we dealt with was developing their own macerator. Those of you maybe in the agriculture world would know Macerators are nothing new. They've been on the market for maybe 50, 60, 70 years, but they have one major um, shortcoming, and that is if you get a jam in it, which happens very, very frequently, sometimes it can take two or three hours to uh, clear it. But this company, if you have a jam with the one that they've uh, developed, you can clear it out in about a minute. So a huge attraction to farmers and people involved in the agricultural industry. Moving on to pharma, I worked on this for myself, a medicine for newborn calves. Um, and, and, and also it, it does apply to the cow itself. It, it, it's a, um, a fairly much a challenging situation for a cow to feed uh, for, for, for a period from its own milk. So there are medicines that reinforce the health of the, the, the cow and the calves as well. And as a result of this project, um, the company is now in negotiations with Enterprise Ireland to become a client company of Enterprise Ireland because they're now beyond the 10 uh, employment level and they have a whole raft of new medicines that will has huge export potential. In fact, it's uh, I think 10 to 20 new medicines they intend to develop. Ready-made meals, new nutritional products and automated systems. One of the uh, automation aspects of um, preparing food for presentation in supermarkets and so on is the scoops, believe it or not, the scoops of mashed potato that appears on the tray. Now, it's hard to believe, but one, one company, and by no means a large company, is processing anything between seven and eight tons of mashed potato a week. Now, when you consider that two scoops has to come out per tray, has to come out of that, you can imagine the human effort that's put into that. But they have been very successful in developing an automatic scoop system. It's in prototype stage now. And from that point of view, it's been success. There are still shortcomings to it, but the company will work on it and um, I'm sure it'll be successful. Medical devices, this is just uh, being able to process orders by having the details of the device sent in digitally and then the digital footprint of the um, part that has to be made will communicate uh, directly with the manufacturing system uh, on their shop floor. So that was a, a successful product uh, project as well. Electronic assemblies, this was a relatively new company, a Leo company. They're in business for about uh, four or five years now um, and carrying out very, very high quality work. But of course, they want to get into a step change, which, which is uh, going into the aerospace industry. To get into that, you have to be accredited to a standard called AS9100. And uh, they, they, they're, they're on their pathway for that. And they are also introducing much more uh, high-speed assembly equipment as well. So we were involved with that one too. 
The development of the gas equipment for smaller food producers and laboratories have already spoken about that. And if you could move on to the next one, we have so, some more examples. Yeah, uh, a butcher shop, um, they brought out some new products and that's already been claimed. Small engineering company on their first agile, 19K claimed. Another company, 58K in the small engineering company and that started. Medium-sized food company, 75K, project completed. Small food, another project completed. Small cheese company. So, so you can see there the full range that there are, you know, anything from 20K to 157K. And um, we've assisted these companies to, to get this over the line. And it's really a bit of a hand-holding exercise at first. Uh, as I've pointed out, the documentation is, you know, it is onerous enough, but it doesn't matter who you deal with, whether it's the LEO, Enterprise Ireland, Science Foundation Ireland, they all have to, you have to complete the template. And the more information you give to Enterprise Ireland or the LEO uh, organization, the more chance you have of them being able to understand it properly and uh, you have a better chance of being approved. And as Padraig's saying, there's a very, very high rate of approval uh, after all of this work has been done. So uh, if you'd like to go on again, Andy, please. Okay. Now, the, the claim part is, is uh, now it's a bit down the road. That's after you've got your project successful and done it. But it is an accolade heel with most companies because it's like the eaten bread is soon forgotten. Uh, what happens is that when, when you claim for it, and whether it's Enterprise Ireland or the LEO organization, they're pretty forensic in figuring out, well, if you spent this, can you prove it? And if, if you have salaries, you have to display the pay, uh, payroll records and so on. So it's something that we are in, in Pembroke Alliance are beginning to develop because we are finding an awful lot of companies don't do this very well. And you have to have a, pro a progress report, which details where are you now? Are you 75 complete? Are you 50% complete? How successful have you been? And how are you going to conduct the remainder of the project? A director statement, that's really a, a legal document where the uh, managing director of the company again confirms that everything that's been costed and has been declared is truthful and accurate. Now, another thing is timesheets, because um, the salary uh, portion of the project is usually 35 to 40 percent. That's where a lot of the money is on timesheets. And I have to compliment Enterprise Ireland. Since June uh, last year, they brought out a new timesheet, which is basically an Excel document, but it's a very, very clever Excel document because it tracks each employee per week for the duration of the uh, project and then adds up it adds it all up for you that you had to do manually before but this is a much more uh, rigorous and uh, very well thought through uh, document and enterprise ireland if you're working directly with them they are now insisting that you have these timesheets uh, uh, available for inspection so the Agile claim is a serious body of work, and it's especially the case in relation to correlating all the, the, the financial data. So everything must be kosher when you present it to be paid, and that's the, the whole idea of it. Okay, if we move on a bit more. Oh yeah, now this is just to show you what has been achieved with the R&D projects. A butcher shop that, you know, just wanted to uh, introduce new products, which they would uh, sell to, you know, own brand delivery to other companies in the food business. They had an absolutely amazing uh, performance. And within one year, they were developing 600K on a product line, which was far greater than what they were doing uh, in, in their butchery business. So that was a tremendous success. An engineering company that John dealt with uh, generated new equipment sales of a quarter of a million in, in the US as a result of a, an agile innovation uh, project. Small food companies grew sales by 5K per week to currently 60K per week. 
medium-sized food company again, went from 5 million to 10 million within two years. And the small cheese company grew sales by a further 50K per annum. Medium-sized company grew sales from 12 million to 20 million. And the, the, these were not expectations that the company really had, but they were successful, very, very successful. And to reiterate what Paul was saying, if you don't get in the business of producing ideas and getting involved with R&D, you'll never know. And more than likely, you go backwards rather than going forwards. So I think that's about as much for me. But if you move on again. Um, yeah, now John is going to speak to you on this. So finally, it just remains for me to wish you all the best with your businesses. Um, while we're making the point that there's quite a bit of work on the paperwork, we're there to support you and help you. And um, we'd be delighted to do it and uh, just wish you well for the future of your businesses. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Aidan. Um, that, that was much appreciated. And I'll bring John in in a moment now on that boost scheme. Um, I suppose just to reiterate again, while we needed to go through the process with you, the local enterprise office has a panel of mentors across different with different expertise, and we will help you through that process yeah. from the start to the to finish. So, so just to to reiterate that message, and I suppose from today I'll circulate the, the short project plan document, the two page one, and that's really the starting point to to narrow down what the idea and what the innovation is, and we'll help you and and take it from there in terms of the process. You know, so just to to start there and just to remind that that there's a whole panel of people who can work with you and help you on this.